I think it's safe to say that mobile apps aren't going away anytime soon. However, it's also safe to say that the tooling frameworks, the, the devices and markets will continue to evolve as well. Mobile today looks very different than it did 10 years ago, and it will look very different again 10 years from now. The best thing we can do is continue striving to build great software, keep one eye on the horizon, and keep the other focused on pragmatic solutions for today. Hey, devs, and welcome back to another episode of the Goobar Podcast, where we talk about building great software and helping others do the same. Here we have short chats about things like software development and building your ideal career in tech. We aim to foster a sense of community, connection, and inspiration so we can all continue to dream, learn, and create. How's everybody doing today? I hope that you are doing well. I hope your week is off to a great start. Uh, this week, I want to just chat a bit about the state of mobile development in 2021. I think it's really easy to get kind of caught up in our own little corners of the kind of mobile development ecosystem, and, and we start to maybe lose sight of um, everything that's going on out there. And so I'm going to just kind of look at a few different questions around mobile development and kind of explore some of the the nuances there, some of the statistics around things like, you know, mobile operating systems, how developers are building apps and some things like that. So without uh, too much further ado, let's go ahead and jump in by first looking at what operating systems are mobile devices running these days. And it's probably no big surprise there that the primary operating systems are Android and iOS, or, or really more like iOS, watchOS, iPadOS, all of the, the Apple mobile operating systems. Now, if we're zeroing in on those two, you know, Android is still the, the most widely used mobile operating system in the world, while iOS is still seemingly the, the more profitable, especially for kind of smaller companies um, and, and in affluent markets. There's more revenue being generated specifically through the, the Apple App Store. Whereas on the Android side of things, I think a lot of times it's more of a, a market share play. You know, larger companies are, are looking to have their, their software available to more users, and that's kind of how they're, they're planning to make their money. Now, outside of the, the, the iOS, the watchOS, and, and Android and all that, you know, there are actually are a handful of other mobile operating systems. So there is Harmony OS from Huawei, uh, and that is um, really, really more an active development, especially as uh, uh, Google has, you know, uh, barred play services from working on Huawei devices. So Harmony OS is something that's going to be coming on the line and and really, that's uh, hundreds of millions of devices potentially. So Harmony OS is something that is poised to potentially make a bit of a splash in the mobile ecosystem. Now, there are also still Windows 10 devices out there. It's a very, very tiny fractional percentage of, of the market out there, but, but they, they are out there. Additionally, uh, there is still Fuchsia from Google. Now, Fuchsia is not strictly a mobile operating system. It's more of an operating system for, for everything, as far as we know about it. Uh, Google has still been pretty o opaque about what their plans are for Fuchsia, although you're starting to see more and more commits being out in the open. You see hints about Flutter targeting Fuchsia, you know, potentially, I think, talk of, you know, maybe Jetpack Compose targeting Fuchsia. So... You know, that's something to kind of keep an eye on down the line, but uh, probably not something that's going to make too much impact for us here in 2021. Now, in addition to kind of the stock core Android that we're used to on, you know, Google, Samsung devices, etc., that there's a lot of kind of AOSP variants out there, a lot of, uh, you know, versions or, or flavors of Android built on top of the, the Android open source project. Um, and a few of the notable ones here include uh, Lineage OS, 
Amazon's Fire OS, uh, Oxygen OS, and and many more. Um, and I'll, I'll include a link to the Wikipedia page for mobile operating systems in the show notes because it was actually really eye opening. There's, uh, you know, tens if not maybe a, a hundred or more mobile operating systems listed there. Now most of them are are very very niche, uh, maybe only. Uh, working on a very specific set of devices, but there's a lot of work being done out there besides just kind of the the core, uh, you know, Android and iOS uh, operating systems. Now, with all that said about you know the the operating systems, how are developers actually building apps for these operating systems? And you know we can kind of break these down into a couple buckets. We have native development experiences. Uh, fully cross-platform solutions, and then kind of something in between, you know, some just general code sharing solutions. So on the, the native development experience side, native development, I think, is still kind of the most in-demand skill set if you're looking for mobile development jobs. Uh, if you do some searches on LinkedIn um, or other job platforms, I think that um, tends to play out. And I'll, I'll list some of those statistics here as we're talking, um, moving forward here. So for native Android development, you know, that's going to be development done with uh, Kotlin, Java, or C++ using the, the Android SDK. You're likely going to be building with Android Studio or IntelliJ. You know, modern Android development, as Google likes to sort of uh, tout these days, is going to be relying likely on a lot of Android Jetpack libraries. It's going to have strong open source community behind it. You know, doing some quick searching here, if I, if I search on LinkedIn for uh, Kotlin, I see around 3,000 job postings in the United States. If I search for Kotlin Android, I see around 2,000 job postings in the U.S., um, and if I just do a general search for Android, I see around 25,000 job postings for the United States. So that's that's obviously a lot of jobs out there, and we'll see how those numbers compare to some of the other skill sets here in a minute. And uh, to kind of round out the, the native development experience, we have the iOS side of things. So that's going to be done, you know, with Swift or Objective-C. You're going to probably be building in Xcode, though I, I've heard good things about app code as well from JetBrains. You know, on the, the iOS side of things, it's more of a closed ecosystem compared to Android, so not as much uh, in the way of third-party libraries, maybe not as much in the way of you know, conferences and things like that. But on the flip side, Apple, you know, they provide a you know, pretty solid set of core libraries. They deprecate things quickly so that the API set is, is very solid, very focused. So while it's quite different than the Android um, native development experience, you know, there's some definite pros and, and cons there as well. Now on the, the popularity side, uh, again, doing my LinkedIn search for the United States, I see around 20,000 job postings when I search for, for iOS. So that's you know, a little bit less than than Android, but still 20,000 is quite a bit, and it's quite a bit more than some of the cross-platform solutions. In the realm of cross-platform solutions, there's really three that I, I hear about and, and see mentioned in job postings and discussions. So that's a React Native, a Xamarin, and Flutter. And I'm going to talk about these in the order in which I saw the, the most job postings again on LinkedIn. So first one is React Native, which had about 4,000 job postings. Um, so React Native, obviously we're building for Android and iOS using uh, JavaScript or maybe TypeScript. And then we can, you know, pull in learnings here from uh, the, the native development experiences. We can maybe pull in some learnings if you're already familiar with, uh, with React for, for web development. We have a lot of IDE options. There's a lot of uh, library out options out there. It's a, it's a pretty open community that can tend to leave a lot of different ways of, of doing things. And sometimes they're more or less mature, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Just have to be careful about kind of what, uh, what you're evaluating, and what you're using. So React Native of the, the cross-platform ones, at least in the, the little bit of searching through job postings that I've done, um, that seems to be the, the most popular or most in-demand one in the U.S. 
Um, next up was Xamarin. Again, I'm primarily focusing on Android and iOS here, um, written in C Sharp and .NET. And uh, Xamarin was around a thousand job postings. So see here, by the time we get to kind of the second of the cross-platform frameworks here, we're down to a thousand versus, you know, up in the 20,000s for the native development uh, stack. So again, still a market there, but, but quite a bit smaller. And then uh, lastly here is Flutter. And Flutter, this one's interesting because I hear and see so much discussion about Flutter. Uh, you know, Google does a lot of marketing about it. There's a lot of, you know, developer clubs and meetups and stuff talking about Flutter. And so Flutter like feels really um, exciting. It's definitely newer, so it has that kind of going against it a little bit. But there's only around 600 job postings in the U.S. for Flutter. Um, so that's quite small. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily indicative of anything. One thought or suspicion I had was that possibly some of these cross-platform solutions are maybe more popular and more of a, a freelancing or, or contracting space, which is maybe slightly less likely to show up somewhere like on LinkedIn versus maybe a, a freelancing job board. So it's possible these numbers are a bit skewed, but still at least uh, according to, to LinkedIn on the day I searched here um, at the day of kind of recording, a flutter seemed to be the least in demand of the, the three cross-platform solutions, you know, between React Native, Xamarin, and Flutter. Although Flutter um, potentially has maybe greater upside down the line, has support for Android, iOS, desktop, and web. So it supports um, more platforms than React Native or Xamarin. Um, and like I said, it has a lot of support coming from uh, Google. So it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of this in 2021 and down the line. And now the last uh, development stack I want to talk about is kind of code sharing solutions. And, and really specifically, I just want to talk about Kotlin multi-platform here because it gets brought up a lot in comparison to things like React Native and Flutter. So Kotlin multi-platform is different in the sense that you're not trying to share UI. You're not trying to write one code base and use it everywhere. You're trying to share some core business logic and write that once and share it in multiple places. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit easier to think about integrating that into an existing project, um, a little bit lower risk, especially if you're on the, the Android side of things. Similar to Flutter, Kotlin multi-platform has support for a lot of target platforms. So Android, um, iOS, JVM, a desktop, web front end, web backend. So a lot of potential there. However, a uh, Kotlin multi-platform is still very experimental. Kotlin multi-platform mobile is kind of the more polished uh, version of it or the more polished kind of subset of features specifically to mobile applications and libraries with Kotlin multi-platform. And even that subset is still only in alpha. So it's no surprise that there really aren't anything in the way of job postings here. So I, I saw 23 job postings uh, related to Kotlin multi-platform. So I think it's safe to say that Kotlin multi-platform is not replacing, you know, Flutter or React Native anytime soon. But given that it's really only just now, kind of in early 2021, starting to get to the point where, you know, teams could start thinking about using it in production code bases without um, too much friction, it'll be really interesting to see if it starts to take off and where those numbers are, let's say, a year from now. This podcast is supported by awesome listeners just like you. If you enjoy the podcast and find this episode useful, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. It helps out the show and lets me know how to best serve you all with future episodes. If you have a question or would like to suggest a future topic idea, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to podcast at goobar.io for your question or topic to possibly be featured in a future episode. And now let's jump back into our exploration of mobile app development in 2021. All right, so we've talked about you know the, the mobile operating systems that are out there. We've talked about how developers are building apps. Where are the users getting these apps from? And I, I'm going to include a link to a, a list of mobile app stores. It'll be in the show notes. But again, I was kind of surprised when I look at this because there's so many app stores out there beyond just the Apple App Store and, and Google Play. And, and those are the ones that you usually think of. And then maybe some extra ones like, you know, the Huawei App Gallery or, or the Samsung Galaxy app. But it's usually those big two. 
So I was surprised to see just how many others there were. So like I mentioned, Huawei's app gallery you know, has uh, reportedly 700 million devices online. Um, that's, a, that's a huge number. That's a, a legitimate uh, market share opportunity there. So it'll be interesting to see if more companies start considering investing in development um, and getting their app into the, the app gallery. Now, we also see trends for other manufacturers, you know, Samsung, uh, Sony, LG, they all have their own custom app stores that come pre-installed on the devices, kind of in an attempt to, you know, keep uh, users into their own ecosystem. Again, you know, it'd be interesting to see if, if those start to get more market share, if that starts to drive trends towards development teams looking to those as a way to sort of stand out and, and maybe bring in more users and more revenue. Now, beyond just kind of the specific manufacturer stores, um, you know, some other significant stores are the, the Amazon App Store, which we see shipping on, you know, maybe the Fire OS devices. Uh, there's the the F Droid, um, which is um, one of the, the bigger sort of more, more open source or, or open kind of platforms out there. And then uh, there's lots of other very small, very niche um, platform. So again, I encourage you to check out the le- link just because it was really interesting, illuminating to me just to see how many different places we can distribute apps. Now, again, I should caveat this by saying most of these are for distributing Android apps as Android is much more open in that sense than, than Apple. But, but yeah, lots of places, lots of ways to get apps out there to users. I'm curious, are, are, are any of you building for multiple app stores or, or do you get your apps from different so doors? If, if so, send me a message. I, I'd love to hear kind of how people are considering this, especially if, you're, if your team is developing other stores. I'd like to hear more about kind of what that experience is like and maybe the, the experience or, or the, the success you've had with that. Now, at the end of the day, for, for most of us, we're probably building apps to uh, generate revenue of some kind, whether for the company we're working for or a client for our own business. So I wanted to try and pull up some, some revenue data for Android and iOS. And again, I have a, a link to uh, this revenue data in the show notes. But according to this data, which is coming from businessofapps.com, um, Android in Q4 of 2020 brought in $10.4 billion in revenue. Again, that's $10.4 billion with a B. Uh, and, and on iOS, the iOS store in uh, Q4 2020 pulled in $21 billion. So both of those are huge sums, but it's very interesting here to see that iOS is very clearly making a lot more money than Android, you know, over, over double the amount there, despite android sort of traditionally having more devices so i think a lot of that you know comes down to uh, demographic breakdowns of you know where ios devices are popular um you know possibly ios users having more uh, disposable income to spend a lot of things we could probably talk about and get into there but it's just interesting to point out that sometimes we hear that apps are, are are dead in a sense, that you can't make money there, and yet clearly money is being made. So yes, it, it's more difficult to stand out. The market is more saturated. We might have to rethink the ways we're bringing in money. But clearly at you know over $31 billion of combined revenue between Android and iOS um, in Q4 alone, there is a lot of money to be made still. And now, finally, I just want to talk about some of the the very general trends that, you know, we maybe observed over the last year in 2020 and, you know, what we might see in in 21. Again, not focused too much on any one piece of technology or development stack, but just kind of in the mobile space in general. So like so many things in 2020 and still here in 2021, you know, we're seeing companies, conferences, individuals shifting to online events, uh, webinars, and, and virtual trainings in response to COVID. Um, and this has been interesting 
to see because we're, we're now seeing, I think, great improvements in the quality of online content and the quality of learning resources becoming available to us to help us learn, to, to help pick up new skills. But then we're seeing, you know, a, such a huge decline in the, the one-on-one interactions and in the social time. And I'll be really interested to see how that impacts the, the market, particularly the job market for new devs in 2021. Um, one thing that I am concerned with in this is that we might end up exacerbating the issue where we can learn, we can pick up a skill set, but we don't necessarily have mentorship or guidance to help hone and focus our skill set to help us fill in the gaps to help us learn how to go from maybe let's say learning a programming language to how to actually build a, a successful product. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested to see how this disconnect or how the dichotomy between more and better online learning resources versus less in-person time, less mentorship, less social interaction, see what that does to especially like new devs, um, interns, students, as they're looking to enter the job market and start their careers. Another trend I think we've seen for the last couple of years, um, I think we'll probably continue to see to some extent is that it seems that innovation has slowed kind of as a whole. If we look at um, kind of iOS and Android, just the, the operating system, not the tooling or anything, but just the operating systems, they're really not innovating that much anymore. We're kind of seeing them become um, closer and closer together, starting to care about the same things. And a lot of the the updates year over year um, seem to be focused on things like security and cameras, really, while kind of the core operating system experiences aren't changing all that much. So, you know, a, a couple of those areas that maybe are changing or, or are a little bit more relevant these days. You know, we've seen gesture navigation over the last couple of years start to become the norm. And I think, you know, now these days, 2021, people are becoming very comfortable with gestures. Development teams are starting to pay more attention to that. The APIs are becoming more stable. So you really don't even hear as much about it anymore. That's just kind of become the norm. Um, and, and I imagine as we move forward, Hopefully, you know, design teams, um, UX designers can really keep uh, these in mind and take this into account as we're trying to kind of bring um, the, the best experiences possible moving forward. Yeah, I mentioned security. Um, that continues to be a major focus and, and really is starting to become one of the primary points of competition even uh, between, um, you know, Google and, and um, Apple and, you know, Samsung, et cetera. Um, even to the point, you know, we're seeing Apple having a lot of like marketing campaigns around, uh, security and your, you know, your data stays on your phone, which probably isn't quite true, but it's a nice kind of marketing slogan that they can put out there. And similarly, you know, Google advertises their pixel devices and, you know, special security chips on them and whatnot. So we're really seeing in this kind of day and age where people are starting to become more concerned with security, that security um, built into the hardware, security built into the software, um, permissions models are all really starting to become a bigger focus and a bigger area of evolution for both platforms. Another thing where we've we've seen a little bit of innovation, but it seems like it just isn't quite taking off is new form factors. So for years, especially on the Android side, Chromebooks have been sort of touted as possibly a next big thing, um, especially as a way of getting Android apps into the hands of even more users with these, you know, pretty capable, um, low cost devices in Chromebooks. Um, But that really doesn't seem to have taken off too much. Um, Foldables are kind of the next big one. We've seen a lot of APIs for at least a year, but I think two years now, kind of hinting at foldables, telling us how to prepare for foldables. And yet there really hasn't been a foldable device that has been so successful yet that it's kind of really penetrated the market or penetrated the the mind share to the point where it's forcing teams to consider 
developing for foldables. So again, I'd be interested to see if that changes in the next year, or will kind of foldables and Chromebooks just kind of go the way of, you know, Android tablets, where they're always just sort of out there. You're always maybe kind of tangentially aware of it, but they never really become a first-class citizen for most teams when they're sitting down to design or, or build their app. Now, another trend I think we've seen, not just in mobile, but uh, across sort of really any sort of client uh, UI-based application is that we're seeing development frameworks all start to converge on kind of this declarative reactive UI model with things like React, uh, Jetpack Compose, and Swift UI. Um, and that's actually quite interesting because it's starting to um, um, help bridge the the learning gap between these platforms. And I think um, that that's a great, you know, whether it's declarative UI, uh, reactive programming in general, functional programming, it's great to learn these skills on one platform and have them be so transferable if you start developing somewhere else. So I'm, I'm very excited to see that. I'm excited especially to see how Jetpack Compose um, impacts Android development. I think it'll be a welcome change. Um, so definitely uh, looking towards further evolution of the, the development framework, specifically kind of in the, the UI toolkit side of things. And then of course, cross-platform development is always a hot topic. People are always talking about it, debating it, um, coming out with new frameworks. And yet at the end of the day, we still don't have a cross-platform solution that dominates the market. I think it's unlikely that we do. Um, I think in all reality, we already have one. It's, it's the web, mobile web in particular, and yet that hasn't really um, kind of unseated mobile as kind of the go-to way to get your users um, into your ecosystem on their mobile device. So I think unless uh, mobile web finally takes over, we're unlikely to see a uh, something like a Flutter or a React Native takeover. Um, but but I'd be really interesting to be proven wrong. I think it'd be really cool from a, just a pure technology standpoint to see how someone would pull that off in a way that outcompetes um, native. But I think we're we're a ways off from that. I'm pretty sure here in 2021. We're going to continue to see sort of native being the the go-to for most uh, teams. Alrighty, so I'm going to just kind of wrap it up there. You know, the mobile application market and ecosystem continues to evolve, thrive, and keep a whole lot of people employed. Individual companies compete with their marketplaces, while developers continue to struggle to keep up with native and cross-platform tooling, security updates government regulations, fragmented markets, and so much more. Devs continue to be on the lookout for the next big thing while we continue to innovate within our current ecosystems. I think it's safe to say that mobile apps aren't going away anytime soon. However, it's also safe to say that the tooling frameworks, the, the devices and markets will continue to evolve as well. Mobile today looks very different than it did 10 years ago. And it will look very different again 10 years from now. The best thing we can do is continue striving to build great software, keep one eye on the horizon, and keep the other focused on pragmatic solutions for today. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave a review and be sure to subscribe for future chats about software development and career. And remember, if you have a question or topic idea, I'd love to hear from you, and you can send those in to podcast at goobar.io for your question or idea to possibly be featured in a future episode. Thank you so much all for listening. Remember to dream, learn, and create, and I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until next time, devs. 